How many of you, by a show of hands, feel like you're in the game of motivating and developing people? Anybody feel like they're in that game? Does anybody feel like they couldn't attract better people? Okay. So I, I will tell you this because I got into this conversation um, with two different people with this at, during this break. So I, I ultimately believe that the easiest path to grow a business is to attract better people to it. And so often through coaching over the years, I've begun to learn that it isn't really all the magic that happens after somebody comes, but the magic that happens before they show up. So if we always understood the power of what we call mapping, so we had profiles. If you were to say, what's an ideal distributor look like? We could tell you what that, that profile was. If you say, what's the ideal customer look like? You know, I could tell you what that profile was. And this was important because the better the person was we recruited, the easier it was to build the business. So if you're having um, an attraction problem, I'll give you a couple exercises you can do to solve this. So whether you're a customer or distributor, it's, it's sort of the same kind of thing. First of all, you need to write down a profile of who is the ideal person for you. Ideal customer, ideal distributor. And what I'm always looking for are things like background, behaviors, belief systems. Like, for instance, I could tell you with distributors that if you look at really successful distributors that go fast, you'll find that they tend to be educated. You find that they tend to be proven entrepreneurs and other things. You, you will find that um, most of them are middle to upper class. Most of them value fitness and nutrition. These aren't people that we had to get to understand the health game. And the more you begin to build a profile, so step one is build a profile. Step two is you have to ask this question, where are they? Because the fact that I can write down a profile doesn't mean I know where they're at. Because, of course, the third question is if I know where they're at, how do I show up and attract them into my world? That's sort of the attraction game. So I had a conversation um, this week because – when we talk about branding, a lot of branding becomes around an architecture. And I usually see people doing things to generate a lot of visibility, you know, that do whether it's advertising and there's all kinds of strategies. But this one particular person that uh, I met in the Gold Coast and she asked if I would do a call and I had a little bit of time and um, I did a call with her one night and she had this this grid thing that she used that she had built and she was talking to about 200 potential prospects a month. And, and I was like, well, my gosh, like what kind of advertising are you running to do this? Because I would have thought mm, not going to happen if you're not running advertising because I have to bring visibility to whatever my brand is. And it turned out that she said, I'm actually not running advertising. That what I've really begun to understand is the attraction game and how content is done and everything was done on Facebook. And we began talking about strategies and had to shift her strategies because some of them aren't necessarily good long term since they're illegal from a Facebook perspective. Good idea. Don't use illegal strategies for Facebook if you use Facebook, just common sense kind of thing. But but I will tell you, her business has grown because she attracted a better person. And when she when we talked about sort of the ebbs and flows of her business, she had a period of time where she grew fast and it fell. And she began to realize that the reason it fell was because she was recruiting the wrong people, the wrong type of customers and the wrong type of team. And she began to correct that. And now things have began to set a better course. So if you want to get into a better game, learn to attract a better person. And then, as I said, you've got to figure out where are those people and then what do you have to do to bring them into your world? And, you know, there's lots of ways we'll talk about this in branding, but that's an important takeaway. How many of you um, felt like you struggle with duplication? Or I, I ask you that one. How many of you felt that you struggle with keeping people in the game? So you, you sign somebody up and then they sort of don't do anything after that. Okay, so not an uncommon problem. So if you're having that problem, I'll give you some places to look from a strategic standpoint. First place, it's a lesson I never forgot that somebody taught me. All disappointment has its foundation in broken expectations. 
So you have to look at what you're doing in the context, whether you're coming from a product or an opportunity standpoint, I don't care which one you're coming from. And you have to ask yourself, am I setting up realistic expectations? You know, if you're in the hope marketing game, this can be a really tough game because in business, it's not about marketing hope. It's about turning hope into reality. That's the game we're in. So you kind of have to look at the expectation game. Now, if you're not doing the expectation game and the attraction game isn't there and you begin to say, well, I just can't get people to work. Maybe you have some of those people. You have to start saying, well, am I meeting with them or am I pushing them too hard? Because sometimes it's what happens afterwards. We want to make everybody get to SC within some period of time to get a bonus. And then the ones that don't get there feel like crap and they just want to get out. This is not a race. Um, it is a journey. And you don't want to push people into a race that they don't want to run when the goal is to keep them around. Um, the other thing with uh, duplication to me is you've got to make this process really simple. And I find that a lot of times the processes of duplication aren't simple. And the best tool in duplication is the upline. And if you're the best tool, then what you do is you strip somebody's ability to have independence in the business. And eventually you build enough of those people and it takes your business away. And then kind of the last strategy goes back to another principle. Discipline is a function of what's important to the individual. So I know every one of you in this room have discipline. I don't know what it is or where it's focused at. But I can tell you, if you raise the importance of the product, for instance, to a customer, you will raise the discipline around that. If you raise the importance of the business to an individual, you will increase the discipline that comes with that. So part of the game that you're in at all time, and let me kind of write this out so you understand it. There's like everybody thinks needs, measurement, <laughs> and vehicle. So there's lots of different needs, sciences. You know, Tony Robbins has, you know, certainty, uncertainty, significance, love and connection. You might know these things. But no matter what need you have, what I can tell you is that you're going to measure the success of it some way. So I'm just going to use an example, and I'm not saying to use this in your business, but let's suppose I get on your product because I want to lose weight. Okay, because, well, we all know, I'll be looking at me losing weight. You can get that part of the story, but you guys all have a weight loss product. So if I get on that, and um, Brian was to be the person that got me on the product, and he didn't ask me, well, what does successful weight loss look like for you? And I was like, well, successful weight loss for me is 30 pounds in 30 days. And Brian would think, well, wow, if I got you to lose five pounds in 30 days, that would be a success. We can fail to keep people in because we don't pay attention to how they measure success. This is really important. And then ultimately, you have to realize, in that example, if Brian's helping me lose weight and I'm looking at Juice Plus or Complete or whatever the product might be, I have to look over here and say, well, how many other things am I looking at to achieve this need? Because ultimately, this is the battle I have to win. If the product, opportunity, our culture, becomes the place that is number one on the needs vehicle, you will never have a problem with engagement in this business. It's when you lose that battle that you lose discipline. So this becomes really important in the early stages of this because what do we do? We market hope and we market it big. Here's what we can do. We don't really kind of pay a lot of attention to whether it's realistic or how somebody sees this. And then we convince them that we're the right answer, whether it's our product, our opportunity, or our culture. And then things go on and what happens? It doesn't work. This is kind of the engagement game we're going to explore. So any questions on that? Okay, so now let's get into how we fix these things. If we're going to talk about change, so this is the, the chart that I use to manage my business and my life. Um, and I use it because I recognize all these things are always in play in the world. So, for instance, today, although I might focus my time on my business, I have to ask myself, how much does technology impact that? Because if I'm not relevant with technology, if I'm not relevant with social media, at some point my business gets punished because I'm not managing these things. What happens if I'm over here 
in the life of a customer and their customer loses the job, their job. This begins to be a reality that I can't control. Of course, what we're going to focus on now is how to get advancing momentum in your business. But ultimately, remember this might be the most important thing on here. Change is about focusing on what you can control. So a lot of times why people struggle with change is because they focus on trying to change things that they can't control. And ultimately, this does nothing but create a path of suffering. Okay, so next thing. If we're talking about change and we're talking about momentum, we're going to talk about a process here in a minute called a pivot. But I will tell you this momentum is really about changing one of three things at all times. I don't care where you're at in your business. The first is mindset, changing your thinking. The second is changing activities. This is changing strategies, getting different skill sets, getting different competencies. It's all the things that, that are involved in the activity of a business. And the final is resolve. So think of resolve as two words, courage and perseverance. It's the idea that if I commit to getting a new skill set, how long can I overcome the obstacles that are coming my way to make that skill set turn into reality? I remember years ago, um, there was a lady that I heard, heard spoke, and she was a blind lady that built um, schools for the blind in third world countries. And she was like an amazing, her story was amazing, her impact was amazing. But what she said, I never forgot. She said that no dream was possible unless it's greater than your biggest obstacle. And so often what defeats change is not the ability to change mindset or the ability to figure out a strategy. It's persevering. It's having the courage to move through this. So as we have all this, here's my question to you. What do you feel stops most people from being able to change? I'm sorry? Yeah. Fear. Okay, so fear, how many would agree that fear is the answer? Yes, I, I can tell you I believe it is the absolute number one thing that stops people from changing in life. And then you have to kind of say, well, if fear is the number one problem, how do I fix this? Because we know that fear can motivate us, and we know that fear can paralyze us. So kind of a good example was I listened to a recent um, podcast on, on Master of Scales with Mark Zuckerberg, and this con concept of fear came up in the conversation, and you would think a guy like that must be fearless, you know, kind of with the success he's had. It turns out it's not the case. It's what his fear is. His fear isn't about a failure of his business. His fear is about the failure of not making an impact on the world. And like he struggles, he suffers with this kind of fear. But it's because of that, that if you look at Facebook at any given time, there's 10,000 different versions of Facebook going on. He, he doesn't care that the business blows up. He cares that whatever he does impacts things. So fear can be a tremendous motivator, but for most people, it paralyzes people. So you have to think about fear in the context that there's only two places where it's created. Okay, the first type of fear is sort of um, genetic to the way our brains developed. It sits at the bottom of our, our brainstem and it's called the limbic system. It's where our emotions are. And within that lies these two little things called amygdalas. And think of them as just panic buttons. So what our brain knows is if we feel fear, that panic button is pushed because this is how we protect ourselves. What's an example of that? How about if I pull the gun and put it in your face? What would you guys do? Most of us would crawl up and, and that panic button would be hit, and hit. But, but I will tell you, that's not the fear most people have. Most people, the fear you have is programmed fear. And what I mean by programmed fear is how our brain works is we begin to focus on things and we give those things meaning. And those meanings are just conclusions and those conclusions become our belief system. So if I were to take something like judgment, so maybe some of you in this room know somebody that have a fear of being judged by other people and, and they struggle with this and, and that's okay. Um, but the question becomes, where did that fear come from? You know, when you were lay, laying there as a baby, were you afraid that somebody was judging you when you were laying there naked in a crib? And of course not. <laughs> so we know that fear is literally programmed, which means we also know that we can reprogram it. So fear doesn't have to stop anybody. Fear can actually motivate people and it can begin to change things. 
So we're going to kind of touch. I got to share one story on fear, just so you know, kind of how much it can change somebody's life. I had a um, a professional fighter I work with. Have you guys ever heard of the UFC? Okay, so um, one day I was teaching a class. I did jiu-jitsu for years and had my own school. And I was teaching a class, and one of my students came up to me. His name was Dean Albrecht, and he asked me an opinion about one of the fighters that he happened to be managing. And this fighter's name was Frank Mir. And Frank's a really famous fighter, was a UFC champion, pretty big guy, walks around at about, oh my gosh, 270 to 290 pounds, about six foot four. And, and he fights in a cage for a living. So you can imagine what, what that is sort of like. So he comes up to me, and, and if you were to look at, from an analyst standpoint, if you were to look at Frank, what you would realize is why Frank doesn't look like he's in very good shape because every time he gets in trouble, he gasses out. In other words, it looks like he didn't train any cardio. And, you know, he wanted to get my opinion on this. And I said, well, I don't believe Frank has a cardio problem. I think Frank has a coward's mind. And I went on to explain to him a coward's mind is, you know, we all have two natures. You know, for some of us, we're lions when we're in charge and we roar, the world is ours. But sometimes there's a bigger lion and there's a more powerful lion. You have to learn how to be the rat. You have to learn how to survive and get through anything. And both of those qualities really matter when it comes to fear. So I shared this story. And the next day I got a call from Frank Mir. Phone rang. Is this Gordon Hester? Yes, it is. Because, hey, this is Frank Mir. Dean told me, you think I have a coward's mind. <laughs> and I remember thinking the first thing was probably didn't language that the right way. <laughs> because I kept thinking, if you know jujitsu, these are the kind of people that show up at your school and want to fight you. And I'm not really interested in fighting Frank Mir. And I never was. So the interesting kind of part of the story was that he said, you know what? Nobody's ever seen this. Nobody ever saw the fear. They thought I had a cardio problem, but I don't know how to fix it. And so often that's the problem. You don't know how to fix it. And the answer is always the same. All I had to do was to teach him to find answers when he didn't have them so that his body wouldn't push that button and go into fear. So for him, his problem was that if you can imagine if I'm laying up against a cage and some guy is punching me and kicking me, he didn't know how to solve that problem. And because of that, it would push that amygdala and his whole body would go feel like cement legs. He would feel all this like these cortisol levels going on and his body would shut down. So what I what I was able to tell him was, look, if you're going to hit me, there's only two things that I got to solve distance or what they call base to the ground. So power to the ground. So I started working with Frank, teaching him how to get distance and how to defeat power. And then after that, Frank had the biggest win of his career. He fought this guy named Brock Lesnar. Some of you might know Brock Lesnar from pro wrestling. If you don't know him, I can tell you he's the biggest man I've ever seen in person. The first time I saw him, he walked in front of me. and It looked like somebody blocked the sun. i never seen a bigger man in my life. <laughs> this guy was like shoulders out to here, walked around at about 320 pounds, you know, just crazy big. And but, but Frank beat him, and Frank came out of there, and he's like, how's that for being a rat? Because Frank only knew how to be a lion. He went on to become heavyweight champion again, and uh, unfortunately his last fight, to talk about belief system and managing somebody's brand, um, his last fight he had in Australia, and he fought a guy named Mark Hunt. Some of you might know who Mark Hunt is. And Frank lost the fight, but he lost a bigger fight. He got busted for taking what they call PED, performance enhancement drugs. And this was the part that ruined his brand. It's an interesting experiment in how communication works. He got busted, and the question is, what do you do? And what he decided to do was to blame. Blame, shame, justify? He blamed, and this was the blame he put out. This was the story. The only reason I got busted on performance-enhancing drugs was because I ate kangaroo, and kangaroo has performance-enhancing drugs in it. Now, come on. This is like it got to be the most ridiculous argument in the world. But I will tell you, because he blamed, shamed, and justified, he lost his brand. He literally had his income taken away from him, and now anytime you see a picture of Frank, they have him standing beside like this red um, uh, kangaroo with his doing the muscle things. It looks all steroided up. It's become his brand. So he didn't necessarily handle it well, and I don't know how he's handling it now. But I will tell you, 
the lesson to this story is when fear shows up, what you have to figure out is have an answer for what's providing the fear. You have to begin to reprogram your mind. And when you can, then you begin to have what we call a pivot. So here's what a pivot looks like. This is all the process you guys are going to have to go through. Um, if you really want to have unlimited and constant growth. The first is all fear starts with a trigger. Now, the trigger could be something that you begin to think about, or the trigger could be something that is dumped in your lap. So what would be an example of a trigger that was dumped in your lap? How about if you had a business with 90% of your business being one line, and then that one line decided to go do something else? Would you agree that would be a trigger that you might not want to have? So what you learn about triggers, if you want to be in a constant state of moment, momentum, is that you want to be proactive in this process. You want to think. You want to begin to see things coming and anticipate before they happen and begin to correct them. This has always been my path. How do I get triggers? And I will tell you that those triggers that you have and that the people you have in your business will evolve around two things, desire and dissatisfaction. At some point, that begins to erode thinking and, or begins to create new thinking. If we look at desire and dissatisfaction, some people might call it pain and pleasure. The question is, which one is more powerful? And what we know is this, this is sort of more from the psychology world, that pain can be powerful until the pain goes away. And then it's business as usual. So the more powerful place to, to use a trigger is to seek to desire more. It's to stay on the positive side of the psychology piece of things. And, and as I said, I go through all these all the time. You know, the story I've been sharing this, this trip is, you know, I kind of recently went through this with um, my, my changing my careers. You know, I, I worked for Jeff for 25 years and Jeff's like a brother to me. And it was what most people would consider a dream job. Um, for me, it was a dream job, except that. I began to become a little bit uneasy about my life because not that something was bad, that I just saw something more. I saw the ability to create greater impact in the world and it started to begin to erode my thinking to a point where I got to this, kind of went through the trigger, went through this analysis thing, and then I got to the point that everybody has to get to, and that's a breakthrough. And that breakthrough, is a moment in time where you decide nothing will ever be the same. That moment in time. Now, what happens if I don't have a breakthrough? Does anybody know? What happens if I don't have the resolve and make a choice down here? As soon as I get into executing a plan, an obstacle comes up. And guess what I do? I retreat. So I believe in the process of change, there is nothing more important than a breakthrough. There's nothing more important than that decision that going forward in the path of change is the only choice that matters. It's the only choice you have. So you make this breakthrough and you begin to develop a plan. So I made my breakthrough with Jeff. I began to develop a plan. You begin to execute that plan. And this is where a lot of people, I believe, get in trouble. When you execute a plan, you have to ask yourself, how am I playing? How am I engaging? So if I were to say, okay, you're now committed to change, are you focusing on changing at a level one or are you focusing on changing at a level 10? And what I always understood about change, for change to work, is that what I had to be focused at was a level 10. I had to pursue all out massive action because if I pursue all out massive action, the results come quicker and I get more confirmation and it makes the process easier. Part of what you'll see when people talk about change in your group, and listen, you guys are all in the transformation business. Don't, don't kid yourselves. That's the business we're in, changing people's lives. You know, that's the health or the opportunity. That's the game. So if I get down here and I have somebody that goes about their transformation with very little effort, very little discipline, very little commitment, what happens? They don't change. They go back. So I'm always trying to strengthen activity. I'm trying to always get people to engage at a stronger level. And then, of course, no matter what I do, I'm always going to measure because ultimately any good business person will tell you once you execute, if you don't measure, what you miss is knowing when to pivot, you know, knowing when to change and to begin to do things differently. And this is sort of that whole ongoing process.
So as you guys kind of look at this pivot process, where do you guys think you need to pivot in your business? Anybody have any ideas where they feel they need to pivot in their business? Sorry? Attraction. So what do you feel you have to pivot on? So you know that if you're going to get into the attraction game, we know we have three things we can do. We change our thinking about attraction. We get into the execution activity game. We change strategies. We change things. Or you've already done that and you just need to have more resolve. Which, which place do you think is going to benefit you the most in your pivot? The first step, mindset. Okay, and what mindset do you think is holding you back? Did you hear that? I'm not good enough. And this becomes what we call limiting beliefs. And, and I will tell you that I believe not only are you good enough, but you're good enough to have anything that you want. And it is so important to understand in the psychology of business and the psychology of life, all that negative thinking will eventually erode your possibility to have greatness in anything you do in life. This is that whole repivoting around belief systems. So if you change that mindset, if you begin to believe that you are enough and that you begin to give to that effort and you see how this plays out and you start to see results and all of a sudden you grow and the strength of your mindset grows. And, and thank you for being the, the one that stood up. But I will tell you this, she brings out a really important point, and that is for almost everything you do that matters in a pivot, mindset will be what makes the change. And we're going to talk more about that mindset. So I wish you luck. It's going to be fun on the other side of things. Anybody else? Nobody. Okay. This was, that was the interactive part. It's oh. over. Yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> that was that was easy. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody in here think they don't need to go through a pivot right now? Everybody's got it all figured out. No matter what, you don't have to change. It is just business as usual forever. Because if you have that figured out, I want to sit down. You come up here, and I'm going to take notes because I can tell you um, working with, like, really people that are much brighter than I am, that have much bigger businesses than I do, I've never had a conversation with them where they're not in some form of a pivot to take things to the next level. This is life and this is business, so you might as well embrace the process. Um, if we're talking about pivoting our business, here are the areas where you focus. If you're, if you're looking at increasing the speed of your revenue growth, then you have to look at prospecting and duplication. Those are the two things that begin to matter. If you're looking at strengthening the core fundamentals, because remember we talked about Speed kills unless it's, you protect timeless and fundamental principles. This is the customer relationships. This is the engagement game. And then ultimately, if you are in that place where you do not feel you're relevant to the way business works, you do not feel you can lead in the marketplace, then this is where you have to invest in the growth process. And then ultimately, um, I put this down here because this is so important. Positive change moves you in the direction of your ultimate outcome. So here's what I mean by that. In, in my story with Jeff, I, I told you that my outcome wasn't to make more money, to have more time freedom. My outcome is impacts. So I was ultimately recognizing that every decision I make in my life now is how do I increase my impact in every moment? And, and because of that being my ultimate outcome, my pivot tends to work really well. But if we pivot on something that isn't a problem, but more of a symptom of a problem, then what happens is the pivot doesn't work well. So all of you have to get really clear on what you ultimately want out of this business, because that begins to be what matters. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Yes? Yes. Constant and never-ending growth. You'll sometimes hear it as, can I, constant and never-ending improvement? I always just call it Kang because I don't want improvement. I want growth. I want a result, not just improvement. So branding. If I look at business today, um, and this is now going to be kind of the structure of where you guys begin to pivot. We're going to get into more details about the process of pivoting. 
in business today. I will tell you that business today has some timeless principles, but a lot of business today has changed. And when we begin to look at how things work in network marketing, you know, why do we see people now have such fast success and such big success where 10 years ago, it would have taken 10 years to do what somebody does in a year. It's because things have changed and things have evolved. And it's important to understand what this evolution looks like in network marketing. What I'm about to share with you guys now is the structure of this and the architecture of this so you can begin to figure out where you need to pivot and what that begins to look like. So we'll start here. Um, as I said earlier, I live in the traditional business world too. And how many of you, by the way, have owned your own business? Show of hands. Almost everybody in here. That's fascinating. Um, by the way, good takeaway there. Almost everybody in here owned their own business before. You might want to check that one down. Um, if you've owned a business, you understand that business begins with ideation. And what I mean by that is you have to come up with an idea. You have to come up with a brand. You have to come up with a product. You have to come up with a service. And, you know, I kind of live in this world a lot with the traditional um, business because in network marketing, of course, ideation already exists. The company's done all this part. I can give you an idea of how crazy this can be. Um, I'm on the advisory council at a university called Wake Forest, and one of the kids that I met with last time I was there he was trying to ideate something that had never been done. He was trying to create a robotics machine where you could put your hand in it and it would paint your nails. Now, I wasn't really sure, like I don't paint my nails, so I wasn't really sure how all this was going to work. But I will tell you that ideation stage of his business to, to build what they call a minimum viable product, to build that test product for somebody was a half a million dollars. So you begin to recognize that for most businesses, ideation becomes can be a challenge. It can shut a lot of things down because it becomes expensive. And then, of course, once we have an idea, you put it in the marketplace. This is customer discovery and validation. You start to see your business models and how big things this get. And if you're lucky, if you have the ability to build something bigger than you, which very, very few people do, you build this thing that we call scaled up. Like you always hear scaling and you scale a business. And that's the idea of building something beyond you. And, you know, what's an example of a scale business that all of you guys know? Choose Plus. You know, if I look at Peter and Louise and Celine's business and Mick and I look at their business, they have a scaled up business. You know, they, they are all valuable leaders in this. But at the end of the day, so much of what's driven is by employees and field. And this is what a scaled up business looks like. And so they're the exception to the rule. But now if we begin to take this over and we say, well, direct selling, that's what we do for a living. We sell products to consumers. What's the problem with that business model? The problem is an ideation. If I work for Tupperware, they tell me what the products are. They tell me what works. I don't figure it out. I don't have to wonder if the customer want them. They do billions of dollars in sales. The problem is the business model. The business model does not allow me to leverage the ability to be paid off of effort, the efforts of others. And that begins to limit my success. So the beauty of network marketing is that the ID, ideation is there. All the customer discovery is there. If you take Juice Plus as an example, I don't know how you can make an argument that Juice Plus doesn't work in the marketplace when we've done $12 billion in sales. It's just almost an, a, a ridiculous argument. And then ultimately, we know in network marketing, because you can build a team, and that team can have unlimited team and unlimited customers. We can scale up a business. And, and I will tell you this, in all the businesses that I look at in my world, I do not believe for the average person there is a better business model than network marketing. Because if you look at what it costs to get into it and what the potential reward is, you start to see the power of it. So I'm just going to kind of give you an example on some math I recently did um, with the Juice Plus company because I was trying to figure out this in my book that I was working on this risk to reward ratio. How much do you guys spend to be distributors every year? You're busy. 165. One, well, I'm sorry? 165? Yes. Okay. So, and then it drops to 150. Okay. So how many would agree that pretty much anybody can afford that? Yeah. Not, not, not that in common. Maybe what you guys don't understand is what's been invested for that to happen. So I went back over time knowing the data that I know, and I will tell you that I believe the Juice Plus company and the Juice Plus error 
has invested over $2 billion so that you guys could have the opportunity you have today. That's the power of network marketing. Imagine if you guys had to go do that. So now as we talk about this, there, this is where the difference becomes. Why do we see people that are hugely successful today and moving at different speeds? It's because the world has evolved. And now we're starting to see that ideation isn't about these things. It's about your brand and your personal brand. We begin to see that this customer discovery validation is the ability to build this tribe. And if we build this <laughs> tribe within a culture, what we begin to create is our own culture. We begin to scale up our own businesses. And, and this is sort of the game of network marketing today and a big part of it. So let's look at how this game works. The first thing is network marketing is different than traditional business. It is different because we brand within a brand. So if you look at the Juice Plus company, you have to understand that the Juice Plus company is up here. They're a company culture. But even within the company culture, we exist within a culture called direct selling and this whole ecosystem. And we know that if we don't do a good job being good corporate citizens of the culture, then the culture could be punished. And this is sort of kind of what drives the whole regulatory issue. But we know also within the company culture are a lot of you that have your own tribes, your own brands, and that becomes your leadership culture. And then we know down here it all starts with branding. So – as you begin to look at the structure of what you're doing in branding, understand this. Because you're a brand in a brand, you don't get to run with no rules. It doesn't work this way. The most important thing the company can do other than supporting you is to protect you. And part of this is that whole compliance world that we're a part of, making sure we do all the things that allow this Thing that we call Juice Plus to continue and to ensure that the best is yet to come. So we have to operate branding within brand. And, and probably I'm going to just give you an example. Um, who can tell me what the mission of the Juice Plus company is? Inspire healthy living. So imagine if I said, okay, I'm going to build your personal brand and your personal brand is you're going to be energy. You're going to bring energy to the world. You want people to feel energy. And this is sort of what you brand around. And now one of the things you marketed was an energy drink and an energy drink that had about 400 milligrams of caffeine in it that you could assure when you took it, it would jack you to the moon. <laughs> now, you could look at that brand and say, well, look, people are getting energy. They're doing positive things. But you have to ask yourself, is that brand in harmony with the cultural brand? Because anytime we brand and we don't brand to protect the company brand, then potentially we all suffer. So we'll have to work in harmony with this, and this will come about as we go through this process. So first thing is, you got to know the game. Okay, we got to know what this architecture looks like. So often when I'm talking with people about this process, what I end up getting into is discussions about pieces. So I might talk to somebody about, I don't know how I build my brand, and we talk about building their brand, but they don't understand that when you have a brand, you have to do other things to build a business. So um, when we look at successful branding, first thing we talk about is how do we become an influencer? How do we become an influencer? Because ultimately, as I told you earlier, influence is a form of capital today. So as we become a bigger influencer, we have more potential in our business. How do we effectively communicate? Because if we're going to operate within the space we call social media, or even through technology, even through tools or anything, we have to understand business is people. And if we can't communicate effectively, we're not going to be successful at any form of branding. And then ultimately, we have to look at this execution. So how does this all work together? How do we turn brands and create visibility and turn that into an audience? And how do we convert that audience into a tribe? And how do we build that tribe into a culture? That is the architecture of this. So what I decided to do this um, trip was to give you guys the model that I built for this. So this is this will explain everything to you. Um, although it might seem busy, it is really not that busy because we're going to walk through parts of it. Where does everything start with branding? That's that first stage what we talked about. Branding, branding is about the ideation and customer discovery stage. Branding is going to be driven by two particular qualities that you have to pay attention to, two perceptions of your audience. One is character, and the other is value. 
So I did not know years ago the importance of these in branding. Matter of fact, I, I've kind of learned over the years, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way. But let's just take these words. If these matter in your brand, who can tell me what value is? What is value? So how many of you, by the way, have your own brands? Okay, almost everybody in the room. Okay, so if you have your own brands and, and you're obviously providing value to an audience, what is value? I like that, solving their problems. So value is the, the ability to meet people's needs and, and meeting people's needs is really a problem solving exercise. So you've always got to look at things and say, if I'm going to put a brand out to the marketplace, what value am I going to provide to an audience? Because if I can't get that piece right, I'm going to have a lot of trouble building something bigger. And then I begin to look at the second one, which is character. Who can tell me what character is? How many believe character is important? Yeah, I will tell you if you don't. Um, I think it's the most important part of branding because I think if your character isn't right, everything goes wrong. But I struggled with this because I didn't know what character meant. I learned the hard way um, because Jeff and I were having an argument at one point in our career where I thought our relationship was going to end. And he got uh, Tony Robbins to referee the argument. Um, now, yeah, it's kind of like a weird thing. And looking back on it, I have no idea what Jeff was wrong about, and it really doesn't matter to the context. Of the but, but I can tell you this. Tony, in that exercise, said two questions that I wrote down that literally changed my understanding of, of relationships. And he said the first question was all gaps in relationships. Anybody ever had a gap in a relationship? All of us. All gaps in relationships evolve around one of two questions. The first is, does this person have my best interest at heart? The second is, does this person bring something to the table? So I wasn't really sure what those questions meant, but I wrote them down. And if they're that important um, to fulfilling gaps in relationships, I needed to figure them out in the business world. So the, the, does this person bring something to the table? That's the value piece. If you think about it, if you have a relationship with somebody, what's an ideal relationship? They meet your needs and you have the ability to meet theirs. That's how business works too. But character um, was tied to the second word. Does this person have my best interest at heart. So I, I took 14 months trying to figure this out, and this is what I kind of figured out after a while. Character is nothing more than a measurement of selfishness. And this is so important to understand in branding because at the end of the day, rule number one for me in branding is that if the market place, if my audience sees that my brand is about serving me instead of serving them, I lose the branding game. So, so much of my communication, so much of, of what I'm doing in the branding is about making sure that people understand my brand, our brand, that we're all a, a part of what Juice Plus, inspiring healthy living is a service-based brand. It is about changing and transforming people's lives. Nutrition Plus, what's the brand? Changing people's lives. It's, it, this is what branding should be. It should be an element in communicating how you serve others, wherever that service might be. And then we get down into differentiation. So if I were to ask how many of you, for instance, are moms on a mission here, I suspect a lot of you kind of fit into that sort of a brand. And that's great. I mean, that's a very common brand in our culture. The question is, why are you different than the other moms on a mission? What makes you stand out? You know, what, what do you begin to show or demonstrate in the marketplace to indicate that you have a different credibility that you care more than people. There's so many ways to differentiate, but it's important that you be able to do this. And this is step one. So now we get into sort of this visibility game. And, and I want to kind of go, go back to one more thing with branding. I want to ask you this question. I want you to think about someone that influences you. Since if branding's an influence game, I want you to think about one person that influences you. So take 10 seconds, close your eyes. One person that influences you. Everybody got their one person? Okay. Who can give me an example? Yes. 
um, a good friend of mine is in another network marketing industry business. Um, she's very much big on gratitude and experiencing the world from those kind of eyes. And she portrays that, you know, flat out. Uh, even at the level she's at, she's very big on that. Okay, so your friend who is in a com maybe a competing network marketing yeah. company, she models a type of thinking called gratitude yeah. that you see as an example, something you would like to model. Excellent. Anybody else? I'll just call on people. We could go that way. <laughs> Anybody else want to share one more? Yes. And what about her? Him, sorry. Alan. I thought you said Ellen. I said, said, wow, a guy named Ellen, that's a little strange. Um, so what about Ellen? Alan. What about Alan influences you? He has a range of colleagues that look at the community at large and impact that. So he's a, a gay man in the country. Yep. Who was today brand new for the CMR to give the colours for marriage equality, which is a big thing to debate through the moment. Yes. And he's been torn down in effect and he had to stand up by his colleagues. So he stands up for something that inspires you to stand up for something. Okay, so if branding is about influence, then let's talk about the three components of influence that begin to be how you have to build your brand. Every person that every one of you thought of will fit in one of these three boxes. So we know that an influencer is somebody that teaches somebody how to think. We know that an influencer is somebody that challenges you, and we know that an influencer is someone where they're a role model in some capacity for you. So even though every one of us might have different answers, maybe it was your dad, maybe it was some famous figure, maybe it was you know um, somebody you just knew that ran a business, at the end of the day, when you think about it, what you'll realize is if we do this well, we can do branding well. So I'm always focused on these three outcomes. So if I'm like, I'm an educator for the most part, I love to teach. I'm an analyst, I'm a strategy guy, but I know that if I teach people how to think, if I begin to teach them how to strengthen their mindset and how to build standards that matter, um, if I begin to do these little elements, if I begin to teach them strategies in business, what happens is I teach them how to think. And because I teach them how to think, I know that it's going to get results and when it gets results it creates impact and because of that you know i have a following i have a brand i have a a group of you know a, a, an influence base that follows me an audience why because i know how to teach them some of you probably a lot of you are inspirational brands you inspire people that's what your story is about and that's great because a lot of people need to be inspired but ultimately, these things begin to be the, the kind of path you need to go around with good branding. So now, when I'm defining my brand, this is where I start. Um, I start looking at saying, okay, I need to make sure that the first thing that I do is define three character traits. So I need to know three character traits, and I need to ensure that my audience sees those three character traits in my thinking and my um, behavior. So I'm going to give you an example of a character trait, um, the character of caring. Everybody understands caring? One of my mentors taught me something I never forgot, that you can pretend you care, but you can't pretend you show up. And ultimately, if you sell caring and then you're not there when it's time to do the job, what happens to your brand? You lose. So... Um, a few years back, there was a study by Bain, um, Bain which is uh, Mitt Romney's company. It's one of the largest consulting firms. And he asked a company, a um, bunch of companies, about how do you do customer service? And they all thought they were great at it. And interestingly enough, he asked their customers, and only about 8% of them thought they were great about it. So I will tell you, whatever you write down as your three character traits, the next question you have to ask yourself is, does the market see that in your behavior? You, you can't preach honesty if you're a dishonest person. You know, so whatever those are, begin to define. This is what differentiates you. So it has to show up strong in what you're doing with branding. The value offering is going back to the needs thing. Now, what I say by real or borrowed, 
sometimes you can take something like Juice Plus and say, you know what, being part of Juice Plus, being part of this community, being able to have a product like this isn't your value, it's borrowed. It's something that's given to you. And sometimes what's differentiates you is borrowed value. I might, for instance, be part of an amazing team and the team's doing well. And because the team's doing well, I can use that as part of my story to begin to differentiate my brand. So it's important to know what value you can bring to others, whether it's your value or something around you that you're associated with. We have to look at this differentiators. We talked about that, but this is the other thing that I want to point out. We often talk about in our business, business and product story. What we don't talk enough about is the story we're pursuing. Why does this matter in your branding? Because the story you're pursuing is really your movement. It's what you will build culture around. And the more this becomes the narrative, the more it begins to attract people to your culture. So I, I think the mistake people make when they have trouble attracting people is because they're not marketing what they're about and what their life's about and the movement they're a part of. People love to be a part of a movement and the more powerful your movement is, the more branding will work for you. So now as we go on to the next step, master the perceptions game. So we talked about perceptions, they're beliefs. They're all these thoughts that go on. So if I'm a brand and I put myself out in the marketplace, what I have to pay attention to is what is the audience seeing? Because whatever they see becomes my reality. Does this kind of make sense? And if you remember, we talked about this. This was really a simple thing. What do we do? Our brain focuses and it says, what does this thing we're focused on mean? And it begins to interpret it. And those interpretations are just beliefs. They're conclusions that our brain makes. And then we know once we give these interpretations, we give them meaning. And this is sort of the emotional component. There's things like emotions and habits, behavioral things that we'll chat a little bit about on cultural addiction. And why does this matter? Because every action and decision we make in life begins to be focused on this. 